Alrighty guys, here we go for chapter 17, section three. As promised, we're gonna talk about chemical hazards. Now, there are just chemicals in the environment. Of course, water is a chemical, air is a chemical, but in general, we're talking about things that have been manufactured in a lab that we're using for some sort of purpose, if you will. Now, certain chemicals that we do find in the environment can cause cancer, birth defects. They can also disrupt the immune system, our nervous system, and our endocrine system. What's the endocrine system? Endocrine, this is what's releasing hormones. Now, hormones get released in our body. This controls our mood, controls our growth, development, and reproduction. So the endocrine system winds up being pretty darn important. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these things. Now, once again, talking about developing cancers, mutations, birth defects. Well, toxic chemicals. First off, let's just talk about carcinogens. Now, there are three broad categories, if you will, from toxic chemicals. be carcinogens, mutagens, and tetragens causing these things. Let's start off with carcinogens. These are cancer-causing agents. Things that we have determined by use in the lab and exposure, that if you are exposed to these things, you are increasing your risk of developing cancer. So, a carcinogen. A chemicals, there are certain chemicals that are known carcinogens. There are certain types of radiation and also certain viruses that either promote or cause cancer. Now, the problem with carcinogens is you can ex be exposed to them, but they may not actually cause the cancer to develop for some 10 to even 40 years later, which is why a lot of times you have teenagers that exhibit risky behavior, smoking or using drugs, some certain chemicals, and they go, oh, it doesn't really hurt because they don't develop till many years later. But these are carcinogens many known carcinogens in the world, cancer-causing agents. Then we have mutagens. Now, sometimes it's your cells mutate, and when the cells mutate, they don't really know when to die, or they don't die at the right age, and this is what we refer to as cancer in general. Some things are carcinogens lead to it, other things are mutagens that will lead towards your cells mutating. And once again, there are chemicals or radiations that either tend to cause mutation or dramatically increase the frequency of a mutation taking place. Now, a mutation rarely causes problems. Mutations occur all the time and usually it's kind of no harm, no foul. But once again, mutation, the more frequently they occur, the more likelihood, the greater the risk, factor of it causing a cancer. And then we have what we call as tetragens. Now tetragens, these are chemicals or something that if you're exposed to can cause harm or birth defects in a fetus. So once again, tetragens, we want to prevent women from having them during their childbearing years. Alcohol is just one of these. If a fetus is exposed to alcohol while in the womb, it can cause different birth effects and cause their brain not to develop properly. So alcohol and many types of drugs are actually wind up being what we call tetragens, lead to birth defects of some shape, form, or fashion in the fetus. Let's take a look at a case study of PCBs. PCBs, these are chlorine-containing compounds, both PCB, poly, Chloro biphenyls, poly mini chlorine. So this is chlorines attached in, but PCBs. Now these were created, they were incredibly stable, uh, non flammable, they would break down very slowly in the environment, but they would travel very long distances in the air. They're fat soluble, so anything that's fat soluble leads to being biologically magnified, right? Bioaccumulation, biomagnification. Now, PCBs are banned, but they're actually found everywhere. A lot of times we line them with various things. We use them as flame retardant materials. 
We realize they can cause cancer, carcinogen, they're banned, but once again, they are found in almost everything. Biomagnification, take a look up at the kind of blip here, if you will. When we just sample water, 0 0.000, very, very teeny tiny traces in the water. But then we go to phytoplankton, because phytoplankton are taking things up in the water, and it increases up to 0 0.0025. We find in the zooplankton, which are eating the phytoplankton, up to 0.123. Rainbow smell, 1.0. Lake trout, 4.3. Now, once again, we're still talking parts per million. But by the time we get way up the food chain of the herring gull, 124 parts per million. And then we begin to see aspects when they're laying their eggs, the shell's not taking place. Once again, teeny tiny trace amounts. We find it everywhere now because it's persistent. It doesn't break down. We banned them but it's gonna be a long time before they really have dispersed from the planet, if you will, because they're just in everything and they accumulate in the fatty tissues. Now others will affect our immune system and our nervous system, our immune system, right? This is what protects us against disease. We definitely do not want anything compromising our immune system, but some chemicals do just that. Now, some of the worst ones, if you will, arsenic, methyl mercury. remember methyl mercury goes back to our case study at the beginning, and dioxin. All of these are things that tend to weaken our immune system. So we're exposed to these, and we're much more likely to catch flu, virus, bacterial dysentery, anything else. Anything that weakens our immune system makes us more susceptible to get any other type of sickness out there. Also, we have things that are neurotoxins, things that specifically attack the nervous system. So anything affecting our nervous system, right? Uh, what ability to think, reaction times, coordination. Now examples, the PCBs, which have been banned, but they specifically attack the neural system. Arsenic, lead, certain pesticides are known to do this. The methylmercury. Mercury in general is incredibly dangerous towards the neurosystem because it affects brain function, your ability to coordinate. Once again, mad as a hatter, right? Anything affecting our nervous system can affect our ability to think, concentrate, our cognitive abilities, and even our ability for motor function. You know, that can't really coordinate quite right. Anyway, these are all things that are neurotoxins. Anything affecting our neural pathways can be particularly bad. If we look at the graphic up here, it's just kind of showing, in a sense, how some of these chemicals make their way in. You know, in the back, we see factory where it's burning. Well, anytime that we're burning coal, there is mercury traces that get in that, up into the atmosphere. Goes into the clouds, and then it comes down as rain. It could be acid rain, and it can just be these particulate matter falling out in, and then it comes down into a lake or any other system. It gets into the aquatic systems, and then it's affecting our food supply. We're pulling food out of there, fish, and the mercury is bioaccumulating, right? It's getting down in there into the water system, into the water system, makes its way into the phytoplankton, zooplankton, small fish, large fish. We're catching fish, taking them home and eating them and it just moves its way up this chain. Not a unusual situation. Solutions, you know, how do we keep these things from affecting our nervous system, if you will? Well, one of the things is we really need to phase out our waste incineration, but this is a difficult task, right? We have so much waste and you get hazardous waste. One of the ways to deal with it is to burn it, incinerate it down to the ash to get it much smaller. We incinerate a lot of our waste because waste is such a huge problem. What do we do with it? Well, it's a problem. Anytime we're burning our hazardous waste, all these plastics and chemicals that get up into the atmosphere, anything gets in the atmosphere, what goes up must come down, right? We want to remove uh, mercury from our coal before it's burned. It'd be another layer of processing it. Once again, coal is one of our dirtiest fossil fuels. We really need to minimize coal as much as possible, but it's cheap. 
cheap energy, and we have so many systems in place to go ahead and use it. But we need to do something to process the mercury out prior to burning it, because once we burn it, we release it up into the air. So as much as possible, we're gonna switch from coal. If we switch from coal to natural gas, if we already have the system set up for burning things, it's already there. But as much as possible, we wanna get away from fossil fuels and into renewable energy sources. We wanna do that as quickly as possible. Once again, uh, fossil fuels just put toxins in the air. There's no way to get around it. We wanna sharply reduce our mercury emissions from any of these points at all possible label any product that has mercury in it. You know, once again, some of our light sources, our um, fluorescents have mercury. We wanna make sure we know what it's in. So if it does break, we can try and address it. We wanna collect batteries. A lot of batteries actually have mercury in it. We don't want these batteries just making their way into the landfill. They really should go to a hazardous waste site. Now, if you're talking about your regular like double A, a lot of those really your nickel halide don't have it, but once again, simply knowing exactly what our products are, what has mercury in it, what's hazardous and not, is just a big help. Now, moving on, right? Some of these chemicals affect our endocrine system. Now our endocrine system, like I talked about before, these are our glands that release hormones and hormones are responsible for controlling most of our bodily systems. Specifically, they control sexual reproduction. For in females, for when their bodies release eggs, they go through menstruation, this whole process is all hormonal. Now also, even with males, hormones control a huge amount of sex drive and regarding sexual function. So anything affecting our hormones is something to really think about. It's also just controlling growth, when to grow, when to stop growing, all of these things. Our basic bodily development, entering puberty, when that occurs, uh, menopause, all this stuff is triggered by hormones. Our learning ability is largely triggered by hormone growth, our developmental stages, and even our behaviors. Moody, as we say, people are moody, right? Well, this is controlled by hormones. Good mood, bad mood, all of this is hormonal related. Hey, once again, it's not a matter of being happy or not if something great happened, but our moods are often controlled by hormones being released in the body. Now there are things that we call HAAs, hormonally active agents. These are also called endocrine disruptors, right? There's the endocrine system out there and some things either enable the endocrine system to work and other things inhibit it, keep it from working. Now, these HAAs, what happens, they have very similar shapes to our hormone receptors and they can bind to them. And when they bind to them, well, there are different kind of things that can take place. We have some that are hormone mimics, uh, the BPAs, BPAs, these are things that we can find in plastics that are manufactured. Well, they mimic estrogen. So when we find BPAs, like in the water supply or anywhere else, well, these things mimic estrogen. So in your body, if your estrogen by and large is the female hormone, testosterone by and large is the male hormone. Now, all of us have levels of estrogen and testosterone in our body, Higher levels of testosterone trigger male hormone responses. Higher levels of estrogen trigger some female hormone responses. Once again, all sorts of things come from estrogen and testosterone and the higher levels we get. So BPAs mimic estrogen. And we also get things that we call hormone blockers and we get thyroid disruptors. Now, some of our parafluorinated chemicals like PFOAs, parafluorinated chemicals, fluorine in the chemicals, that we use like Teflon. We use these to make non-stick cookware. Well, unfortunately, some of these have been linked to thyroid disease, cancer, and birth defects. When your Teflon starts to fleck off, come off of your pan, it's time to toss those pans because once again, these PFOAs have been linked to causing thyroid disease 
cancer birth defects, some of this uh, endocrine system, once again, they mimic different receptors. And also, polybrominated diethyl ethers. That's a mouthful, right? Polybrominated diethyl ethers, PBDEs. We find these in fabrics, furniture, mattresses, and plastics. Well, let's take a look when I talk about these things being effectors or blockers. So some things are mimics, some things are blockers. Take a look in the back. The first picture on the far left, if you will, is showing a cell. Well, on that cell, there are receptors, and then the hormones come in and land on the cell. When the hormones land on the cell, it triggers the cell to enact a response. Now, there's all kinds of hormones that trigger different responses, whether it's time to grow, whether it's time to stop growing, whether it's that time of month, if you're a female, all kinds of hormones can get triggered for various responses. So the normal hormone process as it lands on the cell, the hormones get released from the body. As they're released in the body and they flood through the body, they hit on the cell. As the cell attracts the hormone, then the cell is triggered for a specific immuno response, whatever it might be. I might get a hormone mimic. So this hormone mimic, so the hormone's out there, but the estrogen-like chemical comes in and it triggers the cell as if estrogen was released. Estrogen wasn't released by the body, but the cell thinks it was. This is an estrogen mimic. It's not actually estrogen, but it triggers the cell to think it is. Now on the far right, we see a hormone blocker. So there can be something in your system and it lands on the cell receptor. So the body has released the hormone to trigger a response, but there's a blocker in place. So as the hormone tries to attach to the cell, it can't. So the cell does not realize the hormone's been released. The hormone's in the body, but unless the cell can receive it, unless the receptor can realize the chemical is there, it can't enable the proper response. So sometimes we have chemicals in our body that mimic a hormone. Other times we can have things in our body that block the receptor from receiving the hormone. In both cases, we get a problem in the endocrine system. <laughs> what can you do, right? I don't want these things happening. I don't want my body thinking there's estrogen when there really isn't. I don't want my body blocked from the hormone being released so my body's supposed to know what it's supposed to do, whether it's to grow or develop, uh, what have you, right? Well, you want to try and limit your exposure to hormone disruptors. How do we do that? Well, it can be difficult because we put them in so many different products and foods. Vinyls, right? Well, vinyls are things, you know, once again, like we have vinyl gloves, right? Vinyl might be in your shower curtain. You can come into contact with these all the time. Once again, they can't be burned when they make it into the atmosphere. Anyway, what can you do? Well, a lot of times trying to go to organics as much as possible. Now, this is not always easy to do and it can wind up driving up the price of things. But once again, what can you do? And at certain times, you wanna make sure I'm being very careful, especially pregnant women. So eating certified produce and meats, once again, we're sure the chemicals haven't been used on them. Trying to avoid a lot of processed and prepackaged or canned foods. The lining on the inside of cans a lot of times have some of these um, BPAs on it. And this is where some, when those break down, they can release into the chemicals. Use glass and ceramic cookware instead of heating things up in the microwave. And the plastic put in the microwave and that plastic gets at high heat, it can release some of these BPAs. Store food and drinks, if at all possible, in glass containers. Use only natural cleaning products. There are a lot of um, some products out there, even like moisturizers or lotions can actually contain BPA, some of these polyvinyls, if you will. Avoid artificial air fresheners, if at all possible. Dryer sheets, these things can be on. And especially when you're talking about giving things to your baby or putting things for infants that are growing, you wanna try and get BPA-free items. Um, whether it's sippy cups, pacifiers, 
a lot of these things are just to look at. Glass and ceramics tend to be very safe. Plastics can be, but you're getting a little more iffy. And the more you're reusing a plastic, although I'm all about reusing, sometimes plastics aren't really the best way to go. Now there's controversy over these BPAs. BPA, bisophenol A. Bisophenol A, it is a hormone mimic, but of course, it has to get into your blood system or bloodstream. Now it's in a lot of plastic products, whether it's a, the lining on the inside of a can to keep your can from rusting, whether it's in just a bottle or a plastic baby bottle or in a pacifier, you know, once again, plastics are in lots and lots and lots of things. The thing is, BPAs have been detected in like 93% of Americans over the age of six. And once again, we find it in our bloodstream, it's usually not at what we refer to as toxic levels, but the reality is they're there. Side effects from BPA exposure have been found in independent lab testing. However, by chemical companies that have done testing as well, they're not finding any evidence of these side effects from it. So many countries and states are actually banning BPA products, but once again, it's a controversy. We're just not 100% sure. The reality is when it comes down to a lot of chemicals, we know a lot about a very few chemicals. We know some about a handful, but we don't know a lot about most. There's just a lot of testing still that still needs to be done. To be safe when it comes to BPAs, do your best to avoid them. You know, once again, the less you can cut down your interaction with chemicals, typically the better off you are. Once again, everything is chemicals, but usually we're talking about things that have been produced in the lab. And when it comes down to a lot of our plastics, uh, the verdict's just still out. Uh, we don't know what some of them do. They haven't been around that long, all things considered. We've really only been using plastics, say 50 years or so. And from a human standpoint, it's not a lot of time. Well, guys, that takes us through some of the harmful effects of chemicals, if you will, at least looking at some of the major ones. Next time, we'll look at specifically evaluating risks from some of these chemical hazards. Take care, and we'll see you next time.